Well, welcome everybody uh, to this afternoon's seminar from the Inclusion, Diversity and Identities Research Network here at Edge Hill University in the northwest of England. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome today our speaker, Federico Waitola, and uh, to welcome all of you to join us. And um, so first of all, before I introduce Federico, um, a couple of points about how this can work. So I'm just going to speak for a moment to introduce Federico, then Federico will speak for about 40 minutes, and then you're all invited to contribute to the discussion. Uh, just put your hand up uh, virtually and we'll call you to speak. Uh, we'd ask that you obviously keep uh, your mic muted until then. Uh, you could also post in the chat and Anna, my colleague, uh, Dr. Maragudi, will be monitoring that chat space. And um, so we are uh, hoping that you will all feel free to, to join in a, and have a, a great discussion with us today. So um, my name is Peter Hick. I'm Professor of Inclusive Education here at Edge Hill. And uh, once again, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Federico Waitara, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Special Education at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I have been an admirer of Federico's work for quite some time, actually. Over the years, I've followed his, his work in a number of areas and um, I'm drawn on some of his writings on um, theorising social justice and, uh, and, and, and various areas myself. Uh, his research primarily focuses on urban school districts, how they include students identified with disabilities, particularly those from racial minorities. Uh, within that, he's written about policy issues and teacher learning research. He's currently looking at issues in the relationship of parents of students with disabilities with marketized forms of education, such as school choice. And that's the subject of his book that we've invited him to speak on today. I think this is a really important area of work which is underdeveloped in the UK under theorised, particularly relative to, to work uh, in the States and, and places like Chicago. And so it's fantastic uh, that Federico is sharing this with us and I hope we have a great session. Federico, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hick um, and um, uh, Dr. Mariguri for the invitation, for, for having me here and to Edge Hill University to, to give me uh, a space to, to show some of my work. I'm gonna start uh, uh, sharing my PowerPoint, hopefully it worked uh, a few minutes ago, and we'll do the same uh, uh, at this moment. Uh, let's see. All right, so everybody can see it? Yeah, looks good, Federico, go ahead. Perfect, Perfect. thank you. So, um, as Dr. Schiz was saying, my, the topic of my talk today is gonna be around issue of school choice, particularly for students with disabilities. And I'm gonna be uh, showing you three waves of studies that I've been doing, uh, two in Chicago and one that I'm currently doing in the Basque country. Um, and uh, around issue of school choice, particular students with disabilities and how we play out at the intersections of different social locations, that is at the intersections of race, disability, class, but also uh, geographical uh, location. Um, as you probably know, uh, school choice proponents promise uh, different, um, uh, have different promises. And the idea is that school choice policies uh, will provide equitably, equitable access to better schools, particularly for marginalized families due to this diversification of school options and parental choice. They, they're, they're having more access to different kinds of schools closer to you, hopefully, will give you uh, ac access to school, but also improve the overall quality due to the competition of among schools. So schools will be competing against each other and parents uh, act as, uh, supposedly act as like this, this empower uh, consumers making choices uh, according to the needs of their students and according to the information available to them. Uh, so most of my work has been trying to test these hypotheses, particularly how they play out for students with disabilities or these, these promises more than hypotheses. There's been a lot of critique to school choice. I've been a lot written about uh, school choice, uh, but what I found in the in this this literature is that they they take a unitary unitary approach to difference, unitary 
approach to social difference. Um, and I'm drawing here from Hancock and some work that we did with Alfredo Artiles, uh, looking at how uh, policies, but also we can look at, we, there's been work um, for other uh, aspects of education, like teacher learning and so forth. But the idea that, that we fragment uh, a student's identity, we fragment parents' experiences as well. And you, you see very excellent work, work that has been uh, uh, um, very formational for me, that have shaped since my doctoral years. For example, the work of Stephen Ball on, on class strategies and the education market, um, the work of Eve Ewing on Ghost in the School Year, look at issues of racism in Chicago and school closings. Uh, the work of um, uh, Christine Buras, for example, on charter schools, race, and urban space, looking at the issue of geography, how cities have been formed and shaped, uh, and, and the structural form of racism that, that shapes that uh, urban development and, and school access. Uh, but what we see, for example, these three works is that they tend to uh, avoid or, or, or be evasive about um, uh, issues of disabilities or parents of students with disabilities, and they tend to focus on, on race or class. And another body of research tends to focus solely on students with disabilities. In the US, mostly looking at percentages of students with disabilities that, that attend to different kinds of schools and see what kinds of schools are not providing access to, to students with disabilities. So we have this, this differential approach, this unitary approach that focuses either on class and race or disability. Another theme that comes out of uh, the literature is that the, the, the research on school choice much reflects the, the, the debates and dichotomies that have happened in, in critical geography in looking at issues of place or space. Here, place being the ideal aspects of uh, geography, for example, how parents make meanings of schools. Uh, for example, there's a, a uh, school choice research pointing out that parents may judge the quality of the schools according to the demographics of the schools that they see. Uh, and that's how they, they, they engage in kind of this that sense making, this idea, this place that is it's about identity, it's about meaning making, it's about sense of belonging, it's about uh, um, making sense of, uh, of what we see in the space and, and drawing conclusions. And then there is another aspect of geography, which are the materials after of space, uh, of geography, which is space, which it speaks about the material realities. Uh, for example, the distance between uh, some families and the school, uh, the actual buildings and accessibility of those buildings. So it's been this kind of separation. And my work, I think uh, uh, it's part of this larger body, I think, uh, of work that has emerged in the last years that tries to put place and space in a dialectic, look at not just how parents make meaning out of schools and their spaces they inhabit, but also how those those uh, that meaning making process, those emotions are shaped by how a space, the material space has been produced through different waves of capital investment and urban development in cities and how that is related into schools. So I try to uh, I uh, apply uh, what we call an intersectional approach to school choice research. And we draw here, uh, my colleague Chris Lubensky and I draw from the work of feminist scholars like Patricia uh, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Collins to, to name a few. Um, and also from issues of critical geography, people like David Harvey, Lefebvre, uh, Edward Soya, uh, and uh, trying to look more deeply at the experiences of parents of students with disabilities and how race, class, disability, and geographical location within a city uh, intersect in very powerful and complex ways, shaping their experiences with school choice. As I mentioned before, uh, I'll present mostly about uh, the book that came out in 2020 called Excluded by Choice, but also I'll give you an idea of uh, some work that it's on the pipeline right now. It's been either on review or in press uh, of a second wave of studies that we did on school choice and, and some emerging work that I'm doing right now. I'm currently collecting data in, in the Basque country. So um, in this book, Excluded by Choice, that came out in 2020, I, I uh, kind of synthesized and put together the work that I've been doing uh, uh, since I arrived to Chicago in 2011. And I, 
I put purposefully that quote there from Sius Leonardo from Ber uh, University of California, Berkeley, because I think uh, it kind of portrays what I wanted to achieve in this book. I wanted to achieve the complexity of these experiences, not just to say charter schools are bad for students with disabilities or just to say that they don't provide access or to say that uh, uh, students have uh, poor experiences with schools, but I really wanted to delve what do you mean by that? How was that tied to race, disability, and, and the production of space on, on urban cities. And the book has seven chapters. Of course, I'm not gonna present the entire book. I'm just gonna be presenting mostly about chapter two and a little bit about chapter three. And these are um, stories about how that, that kind of describes in depth and analyze the context in where parents are making choices and making school choices. The rest of the book also talks about uh, what happened with students with these these students, these families attend to charter schools, which are similar to what in England I think it's academies, and when you're here in Spain it's concertadas. Um, and also the book uh, describes how parents are not passive, uh, and actually they fight uh, tooth and nails to to be able to to get access into those schools. Uh, it talks us about the severe consequences that students suffer from certain school uh, push-out practices. And, and it has some theoretical and some implications and recommendations for, for policy. But we'll focus again in chapter two and three, which is about how they choose schools with our stories, what I call stories of desperation and optimistic att attachments. And I wanna focus uh, on this, on uh, the story of Chanel and Morgan. It was a sunny morning in late September, 2016, 15, one of the most beautiful bonds in Chicago. The hot, humid summer was in the past for Chicago residents and the brutal cold winter was far off yet. Leaves were changing colors as I drove about 25 minutes south on I-94 from the University of Illinois and exited towards Lake Michigan and the small black neighborhood when Chanel lived. Chanel was the parent of Morgan, a kindergarten boy with autism. Morgan, Chanel explained, was diagnosed with autism when he was about 19 months. So he immediately went into early intervention programs where he received developmental and speech therapy through early intervention services. And early intervention services in the US are those that students receive or children receive from, from birth to, to age three. By the time Morgan was about to start kindergarten, Chanel had bought a house in an area in South Chicago that had been highly impacted by foreclosures during the 2007 housing crisis. This economic context allowed Chanel to buy a home only for $29,000. She shopped around for a while and looked at almost 60 foreclosures until she found one that was strategically located. Across from her house, there was a park that occupied two city streets, a school that took up another two blocks, a church, and a karate school. These landmarks, made her street appear quiet and safe to her. Yet the walk to her neighborhood school presented a different landscape. She was mentioning that she was not, she was planning to not send her child to the uh, neighborhood school. And she said the following, it's the hood. Even before I moved here, it's considered part of my language, the host role, prostitution. Prostitutes walk up and down. There is a motel right here on this corner. They take Jones. That's this neighborhood. There's a lot of drug activity. To me, it was too close proximity, especially when you're talking about a special needs child who does not talk. So the, the, the near surroundings of her home provided some safety, but the walk to her neighbor's school uh, given feelings of, of unsafety. So as part of my work, I'm very interested in looking, as I say, that how these spaces are produced that uh, shapes these uh, uh, perceptions and emotions. And it's interesting because when I did the historical arch archive, I learned that the history of this area, of Chanel's area, it was not a history of crime and decay. Located at the South, at the center of the south side of Chicago, her area looked very different at the beginning of the 1900s. In the early 20th century, 
Her area was mostly populated by Irish, Italian, Swedish, and Hungarian people. The black population in the area in the 1950s was less than 1%. In 1960s, black middle-class residents moved in large numbers to this area because the area had high standards of property maintenance, high engagements of uh, the residents in community organizing, and good schools. The area became a stronghold of Chicago black middle class with a vibrant culture and vibrant, vibrant black-owned business. So we got to ask, why is Chanel area experiencing foreclosure and crime? when this area in the 1960s was flourishing. And to understand that, we need to understand what happened in the 1950s and 60s and the history of black busting strategies and state-sanctioned segregation that shapes cities like Chicago and other urban cities in the US. So, well, black residents, uh, the answer to, to these changes beyond these, these blockbusting strategies and state sanctions regulations. Also, it's uh, uh, based on waves of capital investments and uneven, that have created uneven distributed uh, geographies in, in the city. So let's talk a little bit about blockbusting strategies and state sanctions segregation. In the 1960s, while black residents move in, white residents move out due to blockbusting tactics of real agents who scared them and urged them to move because their property values were rumored to be decreasing because of the influx of black residents. Contributing to these blockbusting strategies, city laws, state sanctioned laws, derail the development of mixed phrase housing developments, prevented black residents from obtaining equitable housing loans, and prevented also white residents from obtaining equity housing loans to move to majority black areas contributing to um, segregation, not just animal residential, but also, of course, a school segregation. By the, by the late 1960s, the area was 64% black after these measures. Um, by the time I interviewed Chanel in 2015, the area was 97% black and had experienced one of the most severe economic declines in the city. This decline was reflecting a steep increase in unemployment and crime. As I said before, these ways of uh, state sanction segregation and, um, and um, uh, blockbusting strategies from real estate agents and private contractors was not the only force, structural force, that shaped uh, uh, the neighborhood in which Chanel was living. Contributing also to such negative changes in Chanel's area was a combination of declining work opportunities and uh, an economy that was shifting from industry to service. <clears throat> um, the area began to experience what David Harvey, Derby Harvey calls an even geographical development, where waves of capital investment are uneven, unevenly distributed, created new or reproducing former spaces of wealth while simultaneously increasing spaces of poverty. This uneven geographical development is structural rather than random. They are, it's inscribed in the pre-existing racially segregated geographies of the city and builds upon pre-existing structures of racial and economic inequities. Uneven geographical development creates areas of both under and over development and sustain the privilege of wealth white residents, wealth white residents in the city and therefore represents a form for structural racism. And we see this in the city of Chicago. For those who have been in ARA last month and been in the city of Chicago, you'll see this beautiful river walk that was completely developed in the 19, late of 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, as a way to improve uh, the downtown and bring new corporations and economic development and tax revenue. There is also the Millennium Park, where the millions of dollars have been invested right, uh, by, by Lake Michigan. And then uh, in the adjacent areas of downtown, we see areas that used to be uh, deemed as bleak and now has been renovated with luxury condoms, pushing uh, uh, particularly working class residents farther out uh, of the, uh, to the borders of the city. So while, while at the same time there was all this investment, we see areas like Chanel's area 
in where it has been completely uninvested uh, and there's been foreclosures and economic decline. So uh, to complement this work, these this interviews, these uh, analysis of historical archives to understand the history of neighborhoods, we also conducted some mapping. And this is a map uh, to illustrate this uneven an geographical investment. The arrow there points out to the neighborhood where Chanel lives. Uh, the three different maps uh, demonstrate the different demographics and where are more concentrations of Black, White, and Latinx communities. And when you see in those little white dots, they are TIF project locations. And TIF stands for Tax Increments Financing Tools. And I'm not going to get into the, the formula of how this is calculated, but as we, for now, you just need to know that there is tax money that is used to uh, invest in certain areas of the city as a way to redevelop and, and basically bet on uh, future tax revenue that those areas may be able to bring. Uh, and what we see there that uh, these uh, projects with tax investment has particularly made on the center of the city. So I don't know if you see my pointer, but here there will be will be Lake Michigan, and this is downtown. Um, same here and same here. So what we see is a heavy investment on downtown with some spare investment on more uh, south and north uh, west and southwest areas. But we also see some clear demographic patterns in where uh, areas where are mostly white populated, uh, they have much significant heavy investment. Those areas that I'm going to show in a minute in another map are uh, being gentrified as well. But also areas like Chanel in the south where mostly black community have received very little investments as well, which contributed to, to the, the formation of the urban space where Chanel was perceiving as these schools as unsafe. And this is another map that shows the economic uh, um, the economic changes in the city of Chicago from 1970 to 2015. Uh, what you see there in yellow is uh, is, uh, areas where have maintained from the 1970s as upper or middle class or maintained as poverty in, in, in the blue, uh, in blue and light blue poverty and extreme poverty. But then areas are green, that areas that have been increased economically, and then in brown areas, that areas have been decreased economically. And we see there in uh, the where Chanel live, uh, that uh, there has uh, experienced a significant serious economic decline. And if we remember the, uh, the prior map here against downtown, and this is mostly uh, a white middle class area, and this, um, the, the south and southwest of the city is more where uh, working class black communities live. So we go back to Chanel's quote that uh, a spur going into this rabbit hole of the history of urban development. Um, she was very concerned about the walk to school, particularly for a student with a disability that may not be able to read certain social clues or may, may not be able to, to speak on, on, on defend uh, himself. So she decided to not send it to the neighborhood school. But that was not the only reason, but to say um, uh, uh, issues of disability and race intersected in her perceptions and decisions of school choice. Chanel was also fighting for Morgan uh, to be included in a kindergarten placement. Uh, she said she did a lot of screaming and things like that, but he had the ability to talk so he could say words. By the time he was three, uh, I taught him to read. He could read. He could spell his name, but he couldn't tell you his name. He could count to 30. He knew all his shapes, all his colors. CPS, Chicago Public Schools, placed Morgan in a near neighborhood school that had a self-contained program for students with autism. Self-contained program is a separated classroom within the school. Um, but Chanel noticed that despite her son's abilities, the self-contained classroom was a babysitting room. There are another quote from her saying, what it looked like to me from an academic standpoint was him being babysat. And I don't need him to be babysat. The special needs kids to me is that school were not a knowledge at all. My whole thing, she says, don't just tell me he can because he has autism. Let his abilities speak for themselves. So during the entire year, uh, Morgan that was in, 
in preschool, Chanel, are you back and forward with the IDP team, the interdisciplinary team that makes placement decisions? And the, the district offer other options, placement options, but none of them were including uh, Morgan in the general education classroom. So she grew increasingly satisfied and filed a complaint with the uh, Illinois State Board of Education. And she continued to fight for placement. But also going to the back of the history and structural issues of segregation with these Chicago public schools, the district has been focused on textbook court cases for discriminating against and segregating students with disability, particularly those of black. And this is just one example of a court case called the Corey versus Corey H versus Chicago Board of Education of 1992, in which CPS was found responsible for segregating students with disability solely on the basis of their disability classification, like in the case of Chanel, rather than on their individual needs or the individual strengths, violating core provisions of what we have in the US, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. And though the Corey case was closed in 2006. 12, uh, CPS continued to segregate students with disabilities, most of whom are Black and Latinx, at a higher rate than the national average. And here's some data comparing CPS with the national average. And you see that um, compared to the national average, uh, students, for example, with autism are twice less likely to be included in the general education classroom. Uh, and uh, students with intellectual disabilities are more than three times less likely to be included in the general education classroom. And, and similar patterns, for example, for a specific uh, learning disability. So my colleagues and I also conducted a statistical analysis looking at if there were racial disparities on this to kind of continue to contextualize the stories of the parents that we were interviewing. Um, and we found that, uh, uh, in fact, in general, uh, white students with disabilities are twice as likely than black students with disabilities to spend more than 80% of the day in the general education classroom. So you see there in the first column of these uh, tables, uh, says placement category. The first one is more than spend more than 80% in the general education classroom. The middle one is spend between 40 and 70%, and the bottom one is less than 40%. And you see that in all schools is statistically significant uh, the differences between black and white students. But then very interesting in the second table, if we break it between neighborhood and charter schools, it's definitely more significant happening in neighborhood schools, but it's interesting that in the last in the last two years, this is a four-year longitudinal study, uh, we begin to see those statistical significance also for charter schools. When in that particular article, what we argue is that as charter schools uh, uh, provide access, more access to students with disabilities, try to include more students with disabilities, they ended up reproducing kind of the same patterns that we see also in, in neighborhood schools. So, so Chanel here is in a situation in where she has uh, uh, perceived her neighborhood as unsafe, uh, a neighborhood that's been shaped uh, by different waves of urban, urban development that are, are shaped at the same time by structural racism and ableism and how from how the neighborhoods are being uh, developed over time to also how schools treat students with disabilities. So at the end of uh, experiencing um, these uh, structural forms of racism and ableism, uh, Chanel decides to send her son to a charter school. And she tells me, you know how people will make the comment, the devil you know versus the devil you don't? People tell you, go with the devil you don't. No versus the devil you don't. For me, I'd rather go with the devil that I don't know because there is a possibility that it's not a devil. I was pretty much down with Chicago public schools. So like many parents in the book, it was the book has uh, the story of 24 parents. Um, they decided to move their children to or, or start in a charter schools and charter schools uh, offer some of this uh, uh, a, a hope and, and raise some emotions of, uh, of positive emotions and hope and uh, of that things could be better, that these new schools that we're opening uh, will offer them uh, the educational opportunities that have been denied to them in the past. I'm not going to be very in detail because of time purposes, but I'll, I'll share with you some aspects of how charter schools market themselves. Um, to these families. These, the charter schools actually 
uh, uh, um, market to these families and and follow them and 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 were enticing them to to enroll in 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 their schools. And they did this from three different market strategies: the idea of safety, the market they know these families were looking for safety, and they offer uh, zero tolerance policies, very rigorous disciplinary policies that were very attractive to these parents for particularly for these issues of safety, as, as Chanel was saying. At the same time, the uh, charter schools market the same as beacon of academic rigor, a lot of phrases like 100% access to college, to universities, um, and also they were showing this as well-resourced and supported educational spaces with brand new buildings, young teachers, uh, uh, clean buildings with new technology and so forth that were enticing for parents, particularly in the context that they were making choices, as I described in the story of, of Chanel. Um, interesting, uh, we'll go back to this map on economic development in the city of Chicago, but now here you showing you where charter schools are located, what magnet and selective enrollment schools are located, and where closed schools. So Chicago has closed more than 120 schools from 2000 to now. And those are the dots that represents where those schools are closed. And also have opened, but about 120 charter schools uh, or more at this point. And some selective enrollment schools and magnet schools have a longer history. But what I want you to see there is that the area, first the area of Chanel, which said area of significant decline, we have several charter schools open. But also if you see in the third map, a lot of school closings as well. And very interesting you see in that third map also that most school closes kind of cram in on areas of severe um, uh, poverty, extreme poverty. If we move this map to a demographic path where black communities live, we also see some interesting patterns with charter schools that are heavily located in, in, in areas where uh, black families live with very little black families having very little access to magnet or selective enrollment schools, but also uh, heavily impacted by the closings of schools. So charter schools came to replace uh, these uh, schools that were deemed as poor quality uh, or that they were losing enrollment uh, and came as uh, beacons of safety and academic rigor that was so enticing to parents. I'm not getting into this, but the stories of, of the later chapters of the book shows that their experiences in charter schools were actually otherwise. And the irony of this was that the same uh, uh, things that they found attractive of this school was the same things, the same aspects that they pushed them out, like academic rigor and highly disciplinary zero tolerance policies. So the parents on the book, like Chanel, experienced the uh, school choice amid these intersecting forms of oppression and exclusion from state sanction segregation and even geographical development and the rollback and rollout of capitalism that shaped the perceptions of safety and stability in their schools and also deficit discourses about those communities. That's something that I didn't get to talk much about these presentations, but also the in, uh, interacting with these and, and, and multiplying the effects of oppression, uh, uh, policies and practice that slash special education funds and services and continue to segregate students with disabilities as well as deficit discourses for students with disabilities. So we did a second round of studies where we uh, uh, expanded the sample uh, and we look at issues not just with Black and Latinx families, which the book uh, focused on, and did the study with my colleague Chris Lubensky, uh, but also look at issues why middle class families of affluent families and see the experience as well. Um, and we kind of expanded on the work, uh, my prior work, with, in different ways. One is we added a, a layer there of like developmental age or school age, which is also very important at the times of choosing schools where uh, high school parents who have gone, uh, extend, who have passed, who have experienced the school district extensively and been able to form social networks, what Stephen Ball called the, grape, the grapevine networks, uh, been able to, to, to negotiate the school market better than as parents who are just beginning at uh, placing their their children in kindergarten years. But another aspect of this, this web study that is impressed or being reviewed is that uh, the intersections of, of um, race, class, disability, and geographical urban development, they play out in three specific moments of parents' engagement with school choice. And those as when they, when they access information, when they consider uh, and evaluate different school options, 
and very importantly, the strategies that secure placement. Uh, uh, and those three aspects, those three moments are shaped by these, these intersections of race, class and disability and, and results of students enrolling in particular school and not others. And finally, I want to show with you some of the emerging work that I'm doing in the Basque Country. I just did the first round of interviews, so I cannot even call them findings, but actually some emerging analysis. So, so this is something to give you a taste of what I'm doing there. What I'm trying to do here is to test what I have found in Chicago in a very different context in the Basque Country and see what uh, assertions and theoretical uh, um, um, groundings uh, can be applied across context and, and which uh, are very particular to the cultural histories of each locality. Uh, the Basque Country, if you don't know, is in the north part of Spain, uh, um, bordering France, and uh, it has one of the largest concertadas network, one of the largest charter networks uh, in Europe, if not in the world. Uh, in the city where I live, in the city of Bilbao, 52% of students attend to a charter, an academy, to a concertada, but it has a much longer history than the UK on, or uh, the US because uh, they go back to when Franco uh, died and the dictatorship ended in Spain in the late 1970s and the democracy in Spain emerged in the early 1980s. They wanted to expand public education, but they were, the, the country was in, in, in shambles and they didn't have the funds nor the infrastructure to expand public education, but we ended up doing is the left party and the right party party negotiated. And what they did is like they fully subsidize a lot of the Catholic schools and other small private schools to provide free education to uh, families as a way to expand the, network, the public network. Uh, that has brought a lot of inequities as well as they serve also as a sorting mechanism in, in terms of class and disability. Value. So I've been interviewing parents of students with disabilities here in the Basque country uh, and uh, different kinds of uh, the parents with different kinds of social positioning from immigrant parents just arrived from Latin America uh, to uh, more established middle class Basque uh, parents. And these are some of the things that are emerging from this very initial analysis of the interviews uh, for middle class parents of Basque origin, parent necklaces are very important, where for immigrant parents, they rely more on uh, nonprofit organizations and, and actually the state, the state is very powerful and people basically tells people where to go to school. Um, in general, all parents with disabilities have very small choice sets. So they, they consider maybe one or two school only. They don't have many options, uh, even though there's this large network of concertadas. Uh, and here in the Basque country, language instruction plays an important role. Uh, Euskera, which is the Basque uh, language, is a source of identity for Basque families uh, and is a very important factor to choose a school, if that the school teaches fully in Euskera. But for immigrant parents, it's also important because if they're planning to stay here, what families tell you is I want my kid to learn Euskera because it's another way for them to be inserted in the labor market later on. And of course, immigrant parents navigate the system under much more constrained condition. I mean, stability of housing and income. Some parents are moving from housing to housing, some provided by the state, some because the change of rent prices, uh, trying to support families back at home. Many of the, the things that we see with immigrant parents in the US. Uh, and a much larger dependence on state services. Uh, in general, parents are content with little choices. Uh, that's, I think, a little different than the US. 